Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you all for coming out on a Sunday evening. It's incredible to see a crowd like this on a cold uh, end of October evening. Uh, and it's a real privilege today to be able to introduce Max Tegmark. Max Tegmark is renowned for a number of reasons. He's firstly famous for his world-leading work on cosmology, a field in which he's the author of over 200 publications. And he's also the founder and scientific director of the Foundational Research Institute, which supports research on questions at the very cornerstone of the foundations of physics and cosmology. But he's secondly famous for being one of the leading figures in growing the field of existential risk. In 2014, he co-founded the Future of Life Institute alongside Maya Chita Tegmark, um, Victoria Krakovna, Jan Talen, Caesar's co-founder, all of whom are, uh, we're lucky to have here tonight, and Anthony Aguirre. The Future of Life Institute's mission is to catalyze and support research for safeguarding life and developing optimistic visions of the future, with a particular focus on navigating the opportunities and challenges of powerful new technologies. In three short years, the Future of Life Institute has had an incredible impact. In 2015, they held the now famous Puerto Rico Conference on the Future of Artificial Intelligence, which brought together many of the leading experts in academic and industry artificial intelligence research, alongside experts in law, economics, risk, and other related fields. That famously resulted in an open letter calling for research not only on making AI systems more capable, but also in making sure that they're um, safe and beneficial for all of society. That's been signed, signed now by thousands of research leaders worldwide. And FLI then backed this up with a grants program kindly supported by Caesar um, advisor Elon Musk in order to catalyze and enable this research. And then the Future of Life Institute followed that up with the 2017 um, Asilomar Conference on Beneficial AI earlier this year. That in turn resulted in the release of a set of 23 Asilomar principles, a set of principles for the safe and beneficial development of artificial intelligence. And their work has not only been limited to um, artificial intelligence, they've also done wonderful work on risks from nuclear war and nuclear weapons, um, running a world leading conference on this last year and engaging in successful campaigns to encourage divestment from um, investment into nuclear weapons. But now Max Tegmark is becoming famous for a third reason, and that's as a leading thinker and communicator on the long-term future of humanity and the challenges that we as a human species face. Max's new book, Life 3.0, which if you don't have a copy, you can buy um, copies outside after the lecture, um, has been receiving rave reviews from all quarters and we're tremendously privileged to have him here today to explore the key ideas from the book. Lastly, for us here in Caesar, Max has been tremendously important. He's been a member of Caesar's advisory board right from the very beginning, and in this capacity, he's been one of the most energetic and enthusiastic and generous supporters of what we've been doing throughout our lifetime. On a personal note, I've benefited tremendously from his guidance and his insight. So. It's very, very exciting to have you here today, Max. And the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean, for that incredibly kind introduction, which, which makes me blush. And it's really a great pleasure for me to be back here in Cambridge, also in the presence of so many people who've made so much of this, this possible. First of all, CSER, the organization, that was a great inspiration, of course, for the founding of Future Life Institute, and it couldn't have happened in the first place were it not for the generosity of you, Jan, who took a chance on us. Uh, we are also very pleased that the founding of CSER came was an idea that was born out of a taxi ride where Jan Tallinn happened to share a cab with Hugh Price. Where are you sitting? Yeah, so that I take some credit for actually, cause, for actually, because it was at a conference that we had organized. On a, on a different different um, subject matter. And it's also such a pleasure. You, Martin, we s spoke so eloquently very many years ago already about the importance of managing technology wisely, which has always been something which has made me want to work harder on, on, on doing these sort of things. So um, it's, it's great to get to, a great honor to get to speak in front of so many of my heroes here. Um, 
So without further ado, I want to talk about the future of life and how we can make it as awesome as possible with technology. So I want to start here. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. So raise your hand if back in 1969 you actually watched this launch. Awesome. Now this mission was not only successful, but also inspiring. Because it showed that when we humans manage technology wisely, we can accomplish things that our ancestors could only dream of. So in this spirit, <coughs> I want to spend the rest of this talk on another journey. A journey powered by something more powerful than rocket engines, and where the passengers are not merely free astronauts, but all of humanity. Let's talk about our collective journey into the future with artificial intelligence. And I want to use this rocket launch as a metaphor. This is a metaphor I owe to Jan Tallinn, <coughs> and I like it so much that it's going to be the theme of, of my entire talk. Because as Jan likes to emphasize, it's crucial to not only make our technology powerful, but to also figure out how to steer it and figure out where we want to go with it. And these are the three themes we're going to be talking about. During the past 13.8 billion years, our cosmos has not only transformed from being hot to colder, from being very dense to being less dense, but more importantly, it's transformed from being really boring to be becoming increasingly interesting with small parts thereof even coming alive and starting to have experiences, emotions, dreams, and hopes, and so on. But this is a humbling picture in the sense that on the, this large cosmic scale, life is still an almost imperceptibly small perturbation on an otherwise lifeless background. It's also a hopeful picture, though, because it doesn't always have to remain this way for life. Think about Cambridge. Think about this area here, how life has completely transformed the, even the physical layout of this area, right? And <coughs> there's nothing whatsoever in the laws of physics preventing life from going from a tiny perturbation to becoming really the dominant force for the distant, co for the distant cosmic future here. I, have, I explore that a great deal in the book and, and point out that even the most ambitious science fiction writers have mostly been way too pessimistic about the po uh, possibilities for life to flourish on Earth and beyond for billions of years because they underest they hadn't taken into account how much artificial intelligence can empower life in the future. The earliest life I call life 1.0 because it was really dumb. It couldn't learn anything in its lifetime. In contrast, we can learn, so you, so I call us humans 2.0, we can learn, which in geeky computer jargon could be described as uploading new software, designing our own software. I was born with my mother tongue being Swedish, but I decided I wanted to upload software in my brain to let me speak English, so I learned that. If you want to become a lawyer, you can study it here in Cambridge University, and now we have new skills. And it's precisely this ability to design our own software that Life.1 didn't have that's enabled cultural evolution which is ena has enabled us humans to become the dominant life form on, on this planet. Life 3.0, that can design not just its software, but also its hardware, doesn't exist yet. But in, there seems to be a little bit of a trend in that direction. So maybe we humans are actually life 2.1 right now. Some of you probably have artificial knees. We can, some may be pacemakers. We can get cochlear implants, and so on. So in the Coming back to Jan's uh, rocket metaphor, let's first talk about the growing power of artificial intelligence, and then we'll turn to steering it, controlling it, and where we might want to go. I define intelligence simply as ability to accomplish complex goals, as ability to accomplish complex goals. 
The reason I give such a broad definition is because I really hate carbon chauvinism. This attitude that you can only be smart if you're made of carbon atoms. So this defi broad definition of intelligence includes not only all forms of biological intelligence, but also all forms of, of artificial intelligence. Early artificial intelligence, like, for example, the IBM Deep Blue system that beat, beat Garry Kasparov at chess over 20 years ago, had its intelligence largely programmed in by humans. And it beat Kasparov simply because it could think faster and remember more. In contrast, when um, DeepMind's AlphaGo dethroned humanity at the, the board game of Go more recently, this system learned. And in fact, AlphaGo Zero, this, this came out just two weeks ago, learned absolutely everything all by itself with no need for any humans to put in any Go wisdom. In fact, the 3,000 years of human Go wisdom, all those games, all those books, all those poems, all that wisdom, it's figured out for itself in a matter of a few days of just playing Go against itself. And, it, and it's this kind of machine learning which has really been dominating the technological progress in recent years in AI. And just to give, get a little bit of a flavor for how, it work, how powerful it can be, let's look at the, this example, also from Google DeepMind down in London, where it's a very simple system known in geek speak as uh, deep reinforcement learning is playing this game. H raise your hand if you're, ever, if you're old enough to have played this when it was considered modern and cool. Yeah. <laughs> so in the beginning, it sucks. You know, it misses the ball almost every time. But give it some credit, because the this this system has no idea what a, what a ball is, what a paddle is, or what a game is. It just gets input a bunch of numbers, specifying the color of each pixel. And then it tries random things and gets rewarded whenever it gets a, po whenever it gets a point. And gradually, it gets better. And it gradu eventually, it actually gets really good. And most interestingly, not just it doesn't just get better than me, which isn't hard, but it actually figures out a trick that even the, ha the programmers who did this weren't aware of. And look how it just brutally ex exploits this just every single time now. You know, if, if you give your iPad to a little kid and after a while they can play this well, you'd think, hey, this is pretty intelligent behavior. And uh, you might say, well, on the other hand, this game board or the Go board are very simple compared to the real world, right? So, so what other kind of things might, might AI be able to learn by itself? Well, just this summer, DeepMind came out with an experiment they did where they tried to see if, if, if machines could learn to walk with no instruction whatsoever. Here's what happened. remember that th this, this AI system was never showed a video of a human walking. It had no idea what walking was. It just sent random commands, what, what angle to bend the different joints, got rewarded whenever the thing moved forward a little bit, and it eventually figured out not just how to walk a little bit like us, but also how to locomote with all sorts of other body types. So these examples I've shown you here really r raise the question, how far can AI go? Will, are there things that AI will never be able to figure out or will it eventually figure out everything? I like to think about it like this. As a landscape of different tasks where the elevation is how difficult the task is for a machine to do and the sea level is how good machines are at doing them now. Machines are obviously getting better over time so we have a kind of global warming going on in task space here, right? Where the water levels keep rising. You sh I would advise against anyone going into a career <laughs> in right here <laughs> along the shoreline because those are going to be the first jobs to be automated away. But the more interesting question is, how far will the sea level rise continue? There are some very s intelligent AI researchers who think that, for one, that, there was, that machines will never be able to do everything we do, that there are some peaks here which will forever lie beyond machines 
not necessarily because it's impossible according to physics, but maybe just because we humans are too dumb to, to solve AI. But uh, that's actually a kind of a minority view these days. There have been a lot of polls among AI researchers where most of them think that at some point AI will succeed in, in figuring out everything about how to do everything that we can do. And uh, the median time in these surveys for when, when it will happen tends to be maybe decade, some decades from, t from now. So it's, it's worth taking very seriously the possibility that eventually everything will be submerged. Machines will be able to do everything we can do and quite possibly in our lifetime. So if, if, if that's a real possibility, we really need to turn to part two of Jan's rocket metaphor. How do we steer this technology? How do we control it to make sure that it works for us rather than against us, to make sure that it becomes something good? This was the prime motivation for the foundation of CSER and for the creation of the Future Life Institute as well, the organization that, um, that uh, <coughs> we heard from Sean that we've started here. You can see we have the word spear even right up here in, in our mission statement. There used to be a pointer here once upon a time, but I'm, I can't find it, but that's okay. And we are, we are optimistic <laughs> that we can create a really inspiring future with technology if, and this is a very important if, if we win the race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage it. Okay? And the reason this is a big if is because to win this race, I feel very strongly we have to change strategies. In the past, the strategy we've typically used for staying ahead in the race has been learning from mistakes. We invented fire, oopsie, a bunch of times, invented the fire extinguisher. We invented the automobile, oopsie, a bunch of times, invented the seat belt, the airbag, the traffic lights, and so on, and you know, things are pretty much under control. But of course, as science and technology progresses, technology gets ever more powerful. And there comes a threshold of power such that when you're beyond that, you really don't want to learn from mistakes anymore because one mistake is one too many. W instead, it's much better to get things right the first time. You don't want to make any, <laughs> because that might be the only time we have, right? And I would argue that um, synthetic biology might be beyond that threshold. Nuclear weapons, certainly. We don't want to just, oopsie, have an accidental nuclear war and say, yeah, let's learn from mistakes and try to be more careful next time. This is a, ver um, a timely time to talk about that because the day before yesterday would have been the 25th anniversary of World War, five, or World War III, in fact, if it had not been for one particular person, Vasily Arkhipov, who uh, did something very heroic to prevent it. And we, that's actually not showing enough vi wisdom of us, of us as a species. If, if, the only, if we cut it so close that we keep having to count on like one person of really high integrity, keeping, keeping his head cool you know, over and over again, right? You don't want to play Russian roulette over and over again and have that as a sort of long-term strategy from risk management. And another technology which certainly is above threshold is, is super intelligence, where it's much more, more important, a much better strategy to not try to learn from mistakes, but really be proactive, figure out in advance how to get things right and get them right the first time. Some people tell me, Max, no, don't talk like that. That's Luddite scaremongering to talk about technological risk. I say, that's not Luddite scaremongering, that's safety engineering is what it is. If you think about that rocket we launched, we looked at in the beginning, NASA went through very systematically everything that could possibly go wrong when you put three dudes on top of a 100 meter vehicle full of highly flammable rocket fuel and sent them into space where nobody could help them. There were a lot of things they thought of that could go wrong. Was that scaremongering? No. That was precisely the safety engineering that led to the success of the mission. And thinking through very carefully the things that can go wrong in the future are precisely the way we're going to create a great future where those things don't go wrong. One of the things we've done with the Future Life Institute, is, as, as Sean mentioned, is organize conferences to bring together <coughs> top people in AI and top thinkers from other areas to help, help um, develop this wisdom we need to... Uh, win the wisdom race. And uh, these 23 Thilmar principles that Sean mentioned, let me just highlight some of, 
some very important ones here for you briefly. First of all, I should say we were very honored, by the way, that this list was signed by over a thousand AI researchers around the world, <coughs> including Demis Asabes, the CEO of DeepMind, for example, who was responsible for, for these videos I showed. <coughs> it's really, so this is not something, it's sort of fringe set of opinions. It's really from leaders in, in the field. F the first one I want to highlight was that we, we, that we should not, we should avoid an arms race in lethal autonomous weapons. We should, we should have an international ban on, on lethal autonomous weapons, just in the same way that we ban biological weapons and chemical weapons. And, and the idea with this is that any science can be used either to develop new ways of helping people or new ways of harming people. If you ask somebody on the streets of Cambridge what they associate biology with primarily, they're much more likely to say new medicines and cures rather than bioweapons. And there's, in fact, much more funding going into biotech than into bioweapons today. Why is that? It's not through luck. It's because the world biologists pushed really, really hard to get a ban, an international treaty banning biological weapons. Same thing with chemistry. Today, we think of it as a great way to produce new, better materials and so on, primarily. And even though there has been a fair bit of cheating on the chemical weapons ban, it's been an incredibly successful ban because it's created an enormous stigma against chemical weapons. Suppose those of you, raise your hand if you're a student right now at Cambridge University. Yeah, suppose someone offers you a job to go build chemical weapons or biological weapons. Suppose it even pays 5% more than your next best job offer. You're probably not going to take that offer because you're going to be like, that's a disgusting thing to build, right? That stigma is very strong. And um, that's why even Assad in Syria gave up his chemical weapons under pressure because they were stigmatized. And what the AI community is saying is they want to stigmatize that sort of uses of, of AI to make sure that in the future, we also think of AI as, as a way of solving, helping us solve our toughest problems, not just as a new way of murdering people anonymously. So that was one, banning lethal autonomous weapons. Another one is the idea that the AI-generated wealth should be used to make everybody better off. There's obviously an incredible potential to grow the overall economic pie if we can have machines help produce everything we need, goods and services. But there is also there are a lot of economists who are saying that the growing inequality we're seeing in much of the world, which is creating a, a large number of people getting worse and worse off economically, making them very angry, which has given us Brexit, which has given us Donald Trump, that that cannot that uh, that, that is in part due, in fact, to automation and technology, and um, that that doesn't have to be this way. That that it should absolutely be possible if we just really put effort into thinking about how we're going to share this prosperity, that it can make everybody better off instead of ending up more like that. I, I, I personally feel that if, if we can grow our economy dramatically and still can't figure out how to make everybody better off, yeah, shame on us. A third highlight from these similar principles is that we really need to invest in AI safety research. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, in the near term, remember, raise your hand if your laptop ever crashed on you. <laughs> or if this looks strangely familiar. <laughs> yeah, I, frustrating. But, but frustrating isn't the word I would use, probably, if, if what crashed was the machine controlling my self-driving car or my self-flying airplane or, or my electric power grid or, or my nation's nuclear arsenal or something like this. So before we put AI in charge of ever more of our infrastructure, we have to transform today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust, right? Otherwise, all the wonderful technology we make can malfunction and screw us over or get hacked and be turned against us. And uh, as we go farther into the future, if we get closer to superintelligence, then there are additional challenges that come up. First of all, you might be kind of surprised that, that such a who's who in AI signed on to a set of principles that, that even have the word superintelligence in there. Two year, when we had the Puerto Rico conference three years ago, even though we felt that the open letter that came out of that was a very valuable step forward and it triggered a bunch of articles, some silly pictures of the Terminator and, and certain British tabloids and stuff. Actually, the scariest word in it was 
backward pitfalls. It was very peace, love, and motherhood, and we should use AI to make AI beneficial. It was very watered down. But here, these guys are signing on to something, talking about super intelligence, existential risks that will kill us all, and whatever. So, so why are so many serious researchers take, viewing this as something that could happen rather than just sci-fi? Well, basic argument, so why would might go from kind of human level AI to something way beyond us that we might lose control over very quickly? It was articulated by Irving J. Good in 1965. And the idea is it's really very, very simple. Uh, if we have a machine that can do everything we can do, then w one of the, those things is, of course, design AI systems, right? So Google could get rid of 20,000 human employees and, and instead have 2 million or 20 million machines doing the same thinking and figuring out AI systems. Uh, and all of a sudden, the development cycle for making the next generation of better stuff isn't limited by the typical human R&D time scales of years. Maybe it can happen in months or weeks or minutes. I have a start the book with a in, in getting to get with some scenarios along this lo these lines. And, uh, and then the better AI can in turn make still better AI or making still better AI. And it's, uh, that raises the possibility that you might have an, a real intelligence explosion where in relatively short periods of time, you could end up with AI that's so much far beyond us as we are beyond snails, for example. Nick Bostrom described this very eloquently in his book, and we don't know that that's going to happen. We don't know that it will happen, but it's perfectly plausible that it could happen, which is why it's something we need to be careful with. Another reason one might want to just dismiss all this stuff about talk about existential risk as nonsense is one might say, well, why would machines ever want to cause us any harm? I mean, is, isn't that just, aren't we just projecting stupid alpha male kind of goals, like self-preservation and hogging resources onto machines which didn't evolve and shouldn't have any such human goals? In fact, machines that should just have whatever goals we gave them. So isn't this all silly? No, actually, it's not. Because it, it turns out that there's this very simple argument, which I will now give you, which says that uh, if you have a really smart machine, pretty much almost whatever open-ended goals you give it, it will tend to develop other sub-goals that could cause trouble for us. So I made up this very simple, silly computer game example to show you this. Imagine you're this friendly-looking little blue robot here, okay? The only goal you have is to save these cute little sheepies from the big bad wolfie, okay? And we know that's your only goal because we made the game that way just trying to maximize your score, okay? But you're very smart. So first you're going to realize that since you have to act fast so the wolf doesn't have time to eat too many sheep before you can bring them into safety, you want to learn about your environment and find the shortest path. Then you discover that you sh if you go here, you get blown up, so you decide not to go there. Oh, now you develop the self-preservation instinct, not because you had any kind of fear of death, but because you want to save as many sheep as possible, and you know that you can't save any after you're dead, right? This is a very general argument, right? Imagine that you just make, you have your super smart robot, and you just tell it to go to the stand of the store, buy you some ingredients, and come back and make you some fish and chips. If that machine gets attacked by somebody on the way, that robot gets attacked by somebody on the way home, it's going to defend, try to not get destroyed, because if it gets destroyed, it can't make fish and chips, and that's the only thing it cared about, right? So self-preservation is something that very naturally emerges as a sub-goal of almost any goal that we choose to give a smart machine. Similarly, th this thing, this robot will discover that actually if it takes that potion if it up there, it can run twice as fast. So it's going to want that resource because then it can save more sheep. And it might also want that gun because then it can shoot the wolf and save all the sheep. So it's, and that it's quite natural also as a sub-goal of a machine that you give any kind of ambitious goal, but it's going to want more resources because then it can accomplish your goal more quickly, right? Not because it's an alpha male, but just because the resources will help it accomplish the goal you gave it, okay? So, th so this is where problems can start to happen. So in summary, almost any ultimate goal you give a really smart machine can lead to all these sub-goals. Ah, I want better software, I want better hardware, I don't want to be destroyed, I want to be curious, I want to figure out how the world works. And some of these other goals might, unfortunately, clash with 
goals that we had. We have to be very, very thoughtful in advance to make sure that the goals, of the sub-goals of, of our machine are actually aligned with our goals. And let me show you just a really short video that goes a little bit deeper into some of these issues to do with superintelligence. Will artificial intelligence ever replace humans? Is a hotly debated question these days. Some people claim computers will eventually gain superintelligence, be able to outperform humans on any task, and destroy humanity. Other people say, don't worry, AI will just be another tool we can use and control, like our current computers. So we've got physicist and AI researcher Max Tegmark back again to share with us the collective takeaways from the recent Asilomar conference on the future of AI that he helped organize. And he's going to help separate AI myths from AI facts. Hello. First off, Max, machines, including computers, have long been better than us at many tasks, like arithmetic or weaving, but those are often repetitive and mechanical operations. So why shouldn't I believe that there are some things that are simply impossible for machines to do as well as people? Say, making minute physics videos or consoling a friend. Well, we've traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But from the perspective of modern physical science, intelligence is simply a particular kind of information processing and reaction performed by particular arrangements of elementary particles moving around, and there's no law in physics that says it's impossible to do that kind of information processing better than humans already do. It's not a stretch to say that earthworms process information better than rocks and humans better than earthworms, and in many areas, machines are already better than humans. This suggests that we've likely only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg and that we're on track to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature and use it to help humanity flourish or flounder. So, how do we keep ourselves on the right side of the flourish or flounder balance? What, if anything, should we really be concerned about with superintelligent AI? Here is what has many top AI researchers concerned. Not machines or computers turning evil, but something more subtle. Superintelligence that simply doesn't share our goals. If a heat-seeking missile is homing in on you, you probably wouldn't think, no need to worry, it's not evil, it's just following its programming. No, what matters to you is what the heat-seeking missile does, and how well it does it. Not what it's feeling, or whether it has feelings at all. The real worry isn't malevolence, but competence. Superintelligent AI is by definition very good at attaining its goals, so the most important thing for us to do is to ensure that its goals are aligned with ours. As an analogy, humans are more intelligent and competent than ants, and if we want to build a hydroelectric dam where there happens to be an ant hill, there may be no malevolence involved, but well, too bad for the ants. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, have done a great job of aligning their goals with the goals of humans. I mean, even though I'm a physicist, I, I can't help think kittens are the cutest particle arrangements in our universe. If we build superintelligence, we'd be better off in the position of cats and dogs than ants. Or better yet, we'll figure out how to ensure that AI adopts our goals rather than the other way around. And when exactly is superintelligence going to arrive? When do we need to start panicking? First of all, Henry, superintelligence doesn't have to be something negative. In fact, if we get it right, AI might become the best thing ever to happen to humanity. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if AI amplifies our collective intelligence enough to solve today's and tomorrow's greatest problems, humanity might flourish like never before. Second, most AI researchers think superintelligence is at least decades away. But the research needed to ensure that it remains beneficial to humanity rather than harmful might also take decades. So we need to start right away. For example, we'll need to figure out how to ensure machines learn the collective goals of humanity, adopt these goals for themselves, and retain the goals as they get ever smarter. And what about when our goals disagree? Should we vote on what the machine's goals should be? Should we do whatever the president wants? Whatever the creator of the superintelligence wants? Let the AI decide? In a very real way, the question of how to live with superintelligence is a question of what sort of future we want to create for humanity, which obviously shouldn't just be left to AI researchers, as caring and, and socially skilled as we are. <laughs> so on that last note, that brings us to this final point. We need to steer, figure out where we want to go with our rockets, right? <laughs> what sort of future do we want to create? And we, and we certainly don't want to leave that just a bunch of tech geeks like myself, because this is everybody, it's all our future. And we need everybody's wisdom to, to figure this out. I think it's important to remember also, that although Hollywood and news and paper journalists often like to emphasize the downsides of AI, because it's more of a clickbait and improves your Nielsen rating, there's an enormous upside if we get technology right. If we decide to just press pause on technology forever, the question is not whether humanity is going to go extinct. The question is just if we're first going to get taken out by the next 
major dinosaur class killing class asteroid or by super volcano or, or, or something else, right? All of which are things if, which if you ask me about them afterwards, I can tell you about clever technical solutions that, that we can develop for them if we, if, they, if we improve our technology. And in contrast, if we get things right, there are just so many up upsides. Think about all of us have some loved one who, who we've lost because doctors told us that this disease is in, was incurable because we people haven't been smart enough to figure it out yet. These are obviously things that AI can help us with. And all the other problems that have stumped us today are, are, are things we can make progress with if we can use machine intelligence to help amplify our own. And, and ultimately, if we can really get things right with technology, I really think it's clear that we can help life flourish, not just for the next election cycle, but for billions of years, and not just on Earth, but throughout much of our cosmos. So this is really, really worth fighting for to try to get it right. So let's do that. Thank you. So uh, before we start, I just want to say one more thing, which is um, we're going to have some questions now for about 15 minutes. And then after that, don't, don't go away, because we have a really, really nice surprise in store for you. Thank you, Max. Um, for the Q&A, uh, we, we have a couple of microphones, but I think it's going to work best if people who want to ask questions come out in the two aisles um, and um, line up rather than us trying to move the, the microphones around this large theater. While we're organizing that, let me just add a, a, a couple of words to the history that uh, Sean gave you at the beginning. Um, my name is Hugh Price. I'm one of the three founders of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. And as uh, Max told you, th the story all really goes back to the fact that at a conference that he and others organized in Scandinavia in 2011, I happened to get into a, a cab with a, a, a man called Jan Tallinn, whom I knew already from a, an earlier event at the conference, uh, was one of the founders of Skype. And I'm sure some of you can, can, can imagine the kind of thoughts that occurred to me at that point, thought that this has definite Facebook potential. I, I better talk to this guy. <laughs> so I, I asked him what he did, and, 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 and we got talking, and, and, and soon he turned the conversation around in a strategic way to AI risk, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, but the first time that, that I, uh, I was able to get um, Jan to Cambridge to introduce him to this other person I, I, I already knew who was interested in technological challenges to humanity's future, was Martin Rees. The first time I was able to get him here was about six months later in February 2012, when thanks to the wonderful um, um, Center for Science and Policy here in Cambridge, um, we were able to invite Jan to Cambridge uh, to, get to give a, a lecture in their series. Uh, and that was the first opportunity for me to introduce Jan to Martin and, and vice versa. And we decided at, at that point to try to work together to set up some sort of center here in Cambridge to, to focus on the challenges of trying to um, do something about to, to mitigate to some extent the, the, the potential um, catastrophic risks from new technologies in particular. Um, and at that point, um, we, we, we started looking around for support and I started writing to distinguished people who I thought might be sympathetic uh, to ask if we could, if they would like to join an advisory board, if we could use their name. And one of the people I wrote to in February 2012 was Max. Um, Max wrote back immediately. He, he said he was incredibly overcommitted, but he thought this was a wonderful project. But he said he was delighted uh, if we used his name so long as he didn't actually have to do any work. <laughs> <laughs> I found the email the other day and reminded <laughs> Max of this. Uh, but I'm very happy to say that he was soon able to clear away those other commitments and has since then become, I think, really the, the most hardworking person on the planet in this space. And, and you, you, you've seen what um, he and, and FLI have accomplished. It's really remarkable. So thank you, Max. <laughs> Um, okay, so now let's have... Kind words. Um, do, do, we, do we only have one? Start. I think, yeah, so, so let's start here. Uh, thank you for coming to visit us. This is very interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm still thinking about the wisdom race uh, idea. This 
hypothetically if, with the example of the uh, the Go and the machine learning and this sort of thing. So what if we could digitize everything? What if we could put all of the every written word down and then every play chart, every Instagram selfie, everything, everything that's ever been generated by a uh, human race and then had a machine that could learn all these things. Like, does that change the equation? Is there a point at which you think AI could actually be wiser than us if it had all of our stuff written down and learned from it? Uh, very good question. First of all, I, I think there's no doubt that we are already in the process of trying to digitize everything that we think is useful. And uh, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that if you have a sufficiently intelligent machine, it can learn this to become much smarter than us. But wisdom to me isn't exactly the same as intelligence. Wisdom has a positive value to it, right? Uh, intelligence is actually completely value neutral. I define intelligence as being good at a task. You know, Hitler was very good at just killing a lot of people and ruining L London and things like that, right? You, you, you can use intelligence for good, you can use it for bad. The wisdom to me comes into the question of how figuring out how to steer the intelligence in a good direction. So the intelligence in, in, the, in Jan Tallinn's metaphor, I think of as how powerful the engines are of the rocket. That itself that won't tell you about whether the rocket is going to go crash down on, on Cambridge or go to the moon. For that second part, we need the steering. And then to figure out where we ultimately want to go, there we really need the wisdom. And um, I think it's one of the most important things we can do today is to start to ask ourselves, where do we want to go with this? Most of the depictions of the future we see in film are dystopian, right? I just came back from seeing Blade Runner with my wife, yet another dystopia. And uh, I think that's actually really bad. I have students coming into my office quite often at MIT for career counseling, and, and I always ask, where do you want to be in the future? And if they say to me, oh, maybe I'll have cancer, <laughs> maybe I'll get stabbed, maybe I'll get run over by a tractor, you know. That's a terrible approach to career planning because that's going to just lead to nothing other than hypochondria and paranoia, right? But look, that's exactly what we humans do every time we go to the cinema, every time we... we, we um <coughs> so I think another key thing for wisdom development is to really try to think, and you should all do this next time you're in the pub. Talk to your friends. So seriously, what kind of world would you like to create with, with technology? Uh, that will give us something that we can collectively try to steer towards. Um, thanks for a great talk, Max, and I thoroughly enjoyed your book, which I've just finished. Um, I wonder if you would agree with me that the two developments that can either be really wonderful or really terrible are superintelligence and, before that, technological unemployment. Now, it seems to me that we're, doing, we're starting to work on the superintelligence project, thanks very largely to you and Jan and others, I don't think we're doing very much about technological unemployment, and it's going to bite soon. We need yeah. to really start studying it. Do you, do you agree with that? I fully agree with that, and, and so do the uh, vast majority of all the world's AI researchers. Is why is that's one, one of those AI principles. I think most politicians are still asleep at the wheel. Back on the U.S. side of the Atlantic, the last presidential we election we had, right? If you looked at the debates between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, none of them even mentioned AI. Like, hello, they're talking about jobs? That's not on the radar screen. It, so we, ab we absolutely need to worry about it. First of all, if we don't worry about it, we're just going to get an ever more unequal and unpolarized society. And democracies can really only flourish if you, if you don't have too much, too much in inequality. Because otherwise, you just have vast numbers of incredibly angry people who are getting worse and worse off. It's just going to destabilize everything. And on the upside, there are very constructive things we can do also about this. You can start doing experiments. Finland is experimenting right now with universal basic income, some areas. One, one could try things in the UK, do various kinds of experiments. It's far from clear what the best thing is to do to spread the wealth around. Um, some think basic income is a good idea. Other people think it's better to actually use it to hire people to do certain things, like if, if the government is going to give out money anyway, why not give it out in the form of salary for nurses? salary for new teachers, and that way maybe this won't just provide income, but also provide meaning and purpose and, and social connections. So we should try these things now and be prepared to gradually start really scaling it up as automation takes off, not just wait until the world has gotten incredibly unstable and say, oh, I wish we would have thought about this earlier. 
Hi, Max. My name is Peter Jensen. I work a lot with DLT, blockchain, and so on. I just had a real quick question about uh, what you mentioned with AlphaGo Zero, if that's changed any of your calculations in here, and what would be maybe your, your guess uh, of how far away we are from AGI, and if so, where's that investment in number three going to come from? Ah, okay, good question. So first of all, no, uh, AlphaGo Zero didn't change any of my forecasts. It's just another brick in the wall. It's, it's just showing the steady progress happening in the field. Uh, it's also showed how easy it is to overestimate how long it's going to take. M many Go players and even computer scientists thought it would be another 10 years or 20 years until machines could beat humans in Go. And uh, then it happened. And then that was people said, well, yeah, but that was still trained on a million, on, on maybe a million human Go games. Then off it goes zero to show that actually <laughs> all that 3,000 years of human input wasn't needed either. Let's let the computer play itself for three days. So uh, we don't know exactly when age superintelligence will happen, if at all, but I, I think maybe 30 years from now is a reasonable guess. Um, in terms of the well, investing in AI safety research, when we launched this grants program with the help of, of um, philanthropists such as Elon Musk, we just intended that to be seed angel seed funding in the sort of venture capitalist sense to get people excited about doing this kind of research. It clearly needs to be stepped up in a big way. I feel that any government, including the UK government that invests in computer science research, should view AI safety research as just a natural part of what they fund. Just like you would never fund the nuclear reactor research if you didn't also fund nuclear reactor safety research. And I hope we can get that mindset taking hold from funding agencies around the world because there are so many students, talented students at universities around the world you know, who would love to work on this if, if their advisors can get funding to pay them to do it. Um, hi. Uh, so thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm a huge optimist about the future of AI, but just to channel the cynic, for a second. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of excitement about the near future and far future of AI, but the field is famous for having had uh, false dawns in the past. Yeah. And I was just interested to know what you think uh, is different this time, and whether uh, there are any particular technological breakthroughs that mean that sort of the current excitement is justified. Very good question. There's been a lot of hype. In fact, more broadly than AI, there are a lot of other things that have been totally overhyped. So it's very easy to fall for, for this sort of hype. Where are all these flying cars that were supposed to be here by now? Where is nuclear, where are these fusion reactors that were supposed to be here decades ago? On the other hand, there are plenty of mistakes in the opposite direction too. For example, very famously, um, Lord Rutherford, one of the most famous uh, nuclear physicists of all time, said that, n that the whole idea of, of nuclear energy, of getting, putting it to use, you know, doing something, would, was just moonshine. And the very next day, in fact, while crossing the street at Russell Square, where we walked past this morning, Leo Zillard invented the neutron chain reaction. <laughs> it took less than 24 hours for him to be proven wrong. So we have to be very humble when we say that things are impossible. I think the main reason that so many people dismiss superhuman intelligence as impossible is because they, th we th they think about intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in the minds of biological beings like humans. And from my perspective as a physicist, that's just silly. Uh, because of I, you know, I know I'm made of the same kind of up quarks and down quarks and electrons as my laptop is. They're just arranged in a different way, right? And in both cases, in my brain and in the laptop, th what's happening is these quarks are moving around according to the laws of physics to process information. And there's no laws of physics whatsoever saying that this can only be done in, in meat blobs. That's, the, again, this is my diatribe against carbon chauvinism, again, and why I think it's all plausible. And then the, la the, the, the last part of your question, remind me again what that was. Yeah, what's changed? What's changed? What's different from the, from the other AI hype cycles? What's changed is this time, AI has succeeded to the point that it's actually very profitable. So we entered this virtuous circle where companies are making enough money off of AI that th they're using this to create a fantastic job market, hiring more people. It's the hardest thing for students to do these days because there's a very loud sucking noise 
in the hallways of all the world's computer science departments, machine learning. And then when you get more talent into the field, more things get discovered. And I think this virtual circle is here to stay. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, previously, you mentioned rewarding a computer as if it's some kind of behavioral psychology. I was wondering, how do you reward, reward a computer? Is it like you upgrade its RAM, or you just input a bigger number? Or? Ah, how is it rewarded for to, uh, to, to play the game better and so on? Uh, yeah, so it's a <laughs> we use these, these words because Pavlov, of course, had this idea of conditioning a dog and so on, and re we train we train animals this way. In fact, we kind of train ourselves this way also. Um, for the computer, it's, uh, it's the way one actually implements it is there is a rule for how you update a bunch of numbers that controls how it operates based on whether it got the right answer or the wrong way answer. And you set up this mathematical rule in such a way that, the, that when uh, it does the right thing, it like, keeps updating itself to get even better. And uh, it's, it's modeled and inspired by the biological things. But you can take it as just a metaphor. And, the, and what it ultimately shows is that it works. I, I don't have a blackboard. Uh, uh, if you come up to me as a book signing, I can draw a nerdy plot that will illustrate <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> Hi. I was just wondering if there's anywhere already where people are contributing to the discussion of what sort of future we want. Actually, I, I'm glad you asked. I, w w one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I actually wanted to encourage exactly this sort of discussion. The whole fifth chapter is dedicated to a bunch of thought experiments of very, very different kinds of societies that one might have in the future with superintelligence or without. If you go to ageofai.org, which is linked to from the book, you can join the discussion there. And, and But more importantly, I think, People should have these discussions everywhere because it's, these are really hard, hard um, questions. I found when I wrote these different scenarios in the, in the book that, and discussed them a lot with my wife, for example, there was not a single one of them that I didn't have at least some serious misgivings about. And <coughs> I think it's going to be incredibly valuable to have a really broad input from everybody about good ideas for where we want to go. And just to say, make one more pitch for why we should have these discussions, you know, if people only focus on risks, it tends to cause fracturing, polarization, and, and fighting. If, if you can articulate a positive shared vision that people really rally around, it fosters collaboration. Like, we looked at the moon launch, rocket launch, Apollo 11 in the beginning. That came out of John F. Kennedy giving this speech with a really positive vision. We do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard, like Harvard Yard, you know, and, and, and people got really inspired. It rallied a whole generation of Americans around this. It turned America into the world leader in technology after having really been not so interested in, in, in that to a large extent. So w when there is a positive vision, people realize that when they collaborate, they can all get better off. That is really key for building the kind of future that we want. And conversely, if we are completely unable to even imagine what we want, you know, we're not likely to get it. Perhaps if I could just add a, a footnote to that answer. Uh, you, you asked where, where you could go to find people uh, who are thinking about these things, in particular who are thinking about the question as to what the benefits of AI might be and how we can make the best of them. Well, fortunately, we now have two centers here in Cambridge. There's the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which is focused on the bad stuff, not just in the case of AI, but, but other technologies uh, and other sorts of risks as well. But we also have uh, now the, the Levy Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence. Uh, that's focused only on AI, but not only on uh, the scary stuff. It's also focused on these, uh, uh, what as Max says, are, are hugely important questions as to um, uh, what, what the benefits of AI will be if it all goes well and how we can make sure that we steer towards that. Um, yeah, actually, I think now, uh, since I want to save time for a, a great surprise also, maybe what we should do is, those of you who still have questions, if you just please come ask them to me right afterwards when we do the book signing, because then, then 
then we'll have time for a great surprise. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, no, that's fine then. Um, so what I'd like you uh, to all do at this point is two things. The second of them is to stay seated for the, for the, the great surprise. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the first of them is just to join me in thanking Max for this wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So since we've talked about some risks, I want to end on a very positive and inspirational note. <coughs> it's, th it's so wonderful when people do, do really good things ab above and beyond. And I already mentioned very briefly when I talked about nuclear weapons as being a technology where we, our wisdom maybe wasn't quite up to, hadn't quite kept pace with its power. I mentioned this guy Vasily Arkhipov, thanks to whom the day before yesterday wasn't the 55th anniversary of of World War III. Let me just tell you just a little bit more specifically about what he did, namely this. You probably know that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the US and USSR came closer to nuclear war than ever before. But you probably don't know that if it weren't for one man, we would all be wandering around a charred, radioactive wasteland today. And that guy wasn't JFK. In the center of this hot zone was the nuclear-armed Soviet Foxtrot class submarine B-59, which on October 27, 1962 decided whether you personally would be alive right now. While surrounded by a group of 11 U.S. destroyers and the aircraft carrier USS Randolph, the submarine was eventually subjected to a barrage of depth charges. Taking this as the opening shots of World War III Captain Valentin Grigorievich Savitsky ordered the B-59's nuclear-tip missile be launched in retaliation to the U.S. surface ships. Had this been the case, it is likely that the U.S., USSR, Cuba and most of Europe would have had a full shooting war on their hands, cowboy hats and all. According to Director of the National Security Archive Thomas Blanton and former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, a guy called Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. The thing is, to launch a nuke, the top three Soviets on the B-59 needed a unanimous vote. Captain Savitsky and political officer Ivan Simonovich Maslenikov were all for it, but Arkhipov, a mere second in command, was not all that wild about wiping out human civilization. The three got into an argument, and Arkhipov eventually persuaded the political officer that nuking the US Navy was a bad idea, and that they should resurface instead. Captain Savitsky was not happy with this, but since he did not have the votes to go nuclear, the submarine surfaced, and the crisis was averted. After that terrifyingly close call the US and Soviets realized we were all walking a tightrope above a pool of lava, and that we should make peace with one another before drifting into Armageddon. We kept the Cold War going for decades afterward and in fact came just as close to annihilation again thanks to a false alarm in the 1980s. The Soviets had false radar signals showing the US had launched on them, yet another Soviet officer, Stanislav Petrov, would risk everything by standing down. So, but in other words, I'm incredibly grateful to Vasily Yarkipov, for me, I, without whom I would certainly not be standing here today and you would certainly not be sitting here today. In fact, you could argue that nobody in modern human history has made a more positive contribution to humanity than he has. If you think, no, no, it was this other person, think about how much their acts would actually have mattered if World War III would have started in 1962. Now, a couple of years ago, I was in the audience when, when Jan Tallinn gave a, a talk at MIT. And Jan said that we should really try to establish a tradition, a social norm, whereby when someone does something really selfless that future generations will greatly appreciate, they should know, even if they, they should know that future generations will show their appreciation for this. And I thought to myself, yeah, let's do this. 
And I thought, who better to start with than, than Vasily Arkhipov? So we managed to um, track, he, he, has, he has passed away, he passed away in, in 1998 before this even became known. So he was never appreciated for it in his lifetime. But we managed to track down his family who lived outside of Moscow. And uh, we, dis we managed to bring them to the UK to get to see one of the beautiful countries that was not nuked, thanks to, to their father. And on and the day before yesterday, on the non-anniversary of World War III, we gave them this award, the Future of Life Award, thanks to the generosity of, of, of Jan Tallinn. We were very happy that the Guardian and the Times and the Independent also covered it. And uh, here you can see his wonderful daughter, Yelena, and his wonderful grandson, Sergei, <laughs> holding the inaugural Future Life Prize. And I am incredibly honored to be able to tell you that they are with us here today. So please come up here, <laughs> Yelena and Sergei. <laughs> Yeah, do you want to? <laughs> yeah. Good. It's so, so great for it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So we can all show our appreciation. And I would also like Jan Tallinn and Hugh Price and Martin Rees, the three fo founders of, the cent of, of CSER, to give them opportunity to say a few words. And, and, and Vika, will, who, my co-founder here, will, will translate. Uh, we're, we're at absolutely thrilled uh, at Caesar to have this opportunity um, to, to, to thank the family of Vasily Yakov for his extraordinary contribution um, in, doing such in, in doing in such a huge way the things that we've been trying to do in a very small way here at Caesar. Дело в том, что мы пытаемся сделать, что они пытаются сделать это в более маленьком повседневном смысле. Thanks and uh, good evening. Um, yeah, every once uh, in a while, uh, there seem to be moments where like history flows through kind of individual minds and hands of, of people. And as uh, Max pointed out in this talk, there is, uh, as the technology gets more and more powerful, there will be more and more of such moments. So wouldn't it be great that uh, if we could somehow install kind of agents of humanity in these uh, heated moments, uh, either in the like, uh, overheated submarine or in some uh, critical moment in AI lab. Uh, and one, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> going for, for long, but uh, I don't know if, if you can summarize <laughs> anything. <laughs> Иногда история проходит через конкретных людей, и их решения имеют очень большие последствия. И когда технология становится более, более могущественной, то эти моменты, когда решение одного человека имеет большое значение, это становится чаще и чаще. И, а, и нам нужно, чтобы такие как бы, а, агенты человечества были а, в правильном месте в правильное время а, более часто. <laughs> and uh, in, at uh, both CSER um, and at FLI, we're always looking for sort of interesting hacks uh, to increase uh, our you know, chances of surviving this century. And this idea of, uh, of actually creating this culture of being thankful to those people who have represented the interests of humanity. I first remember hearing it from Nick Bostrom in Oxford. And uh, yeah, as Max basically said, the, the idea is sort of lead, lead the way and, and uh, 
and do something concrete and, uh, and make sure that uh, there will be acts of thankfulness uh, like this and, and uh, thereby we create this positive feedback loop uh, where people in the future in critical moments will be sort of aware that wait a minute, they perhaps should think about humanity at this point. Нам нужно продолжать строить эту культуру, где когда люди делают что-то важное, что-то правильное, если они делают то, что нужно сделать, что потом как бы будущее поколение будут им благодарны. So uh, yeah, it's sort of great, great this feedback loop uh, that uh, uh, that when people are in in these moments in the coming years or decades, uh, they would actually remember that that they should be representing the interest of humanity. So uh, the idea of this award is like a concrete act that hopefully will be there will be more of that from FLI, CSER, and perhaps others uh, that kind of demonstrate that humanity can be thankful. Часть этой идеи вот с, с этой наградой, в том, чтобы когда люди в будущем будут в таких ситуациях, где их решения имеют большое значение, то они будут знать, что они как бы, представляют интересы всего человечества и что будущее поколение будет им благодарно. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Ведь я хочу сказать, что это большая награда для нашей семьи, и она является символом победы человечества в борьбе за мир, потому что мир на Земле – это самое важное для всех людей на планете. Человек рождается. Uh, so, so this award is uh, a very sort of big thing for our family, and it's kind of uh, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of it's a symbol of a symbol of sort of uh, humanity's victory as a whole. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's a symbol of uh, humanity's victory in kind of the struggle for peace. Человек, самое ценное у человека – это жизнь. И человек рождается для того, чтобы жить, учиться, мечтать, творить, mm -hmm. созидать, дружить, любить, растить детей, дружить международно. Это самое важное. You know, they can create, they can build, they can learn, they can create friendship uh, between all people. And this is the most important thing. We're very grateful to Max. And the Future of Life Institute. Such a great and important work. Great work in um, uh, the struggle for peace and for uh, preventing all these terrifying consequences of nuclear war. Да, и еще очень хочу сказать, что вот его вот эти действия Василия Осипова. Почему он так поступил? Потому что он сам на себе испытал радиацию. Reason that part of the reason that Vasily Arhipov acted that way is because he actually experienced the effects of radiation on his in his own experience. Когда они на первой атомной подводной лодке выходили в море на учения, то ну случились неполадки. 
So when they get to Yeah, yeah so when they went out um, in the first kind of one of the first submarines out into the sea and there was a nuclear reaction on the submarine, then there was a malfunction and there was like a terrible accident. K-19 boat and submarine. So eight uh, members of the crew actually died trying to prevent this nuclear explosion on the K-19 submarine. So um, many uh, members of the crew kind of ex experienced like radiation poisoning, including Vasily Artikov, and so they uh, kind of experienced it like by themselves how terrible that is. When the Hidden Missile Crisis happened and when Vasily Arthur had to make that decision, then he had this experience of like having known the horrors of radiation to inform his decision, and he knew that the only correct decision was not to launch the nuclear weapon. So, Elena wishes that uh, Nikolai kind of continues to do this work in you know, preventing uh, nuclear war and all the you know, possible consequences of that. Uh, and she was uh, very happy to kind of um, visit London and uh, you know meet all the you know friendly and great people here. And it seems like such a, like a center of the universe. And basically, if we prevent these kind of risks and these kind of potentially terrifying future, then you know we can all continue visiting each other, and there can be the friendships between people, and that's the kind of future that we should have, right? Yes, Martin Rees has some closing closing words. <laughs> well, in closing, I'm sure I speak for everyone here if I say two things. First, that we welcome the setting up of this new award, and secondly, we could not possibly have found a more worthy first winner than the one we have found, and it's great that you're here today to accept our award. Martin присоединяется к поздравлениям по поводу этой награды, и я уверен, что все здесь согласны, что нету более как бы достойного того получителя этой награды, чем Ваш отец и ваша семья. Thank you so much again, man, for making this possible. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, just a reminder that if you'd like to buy a copy of um, Max's wonderful book, you can do so out the front. Uh, if you're very lucky, you may even be able to get him to sign it for you. Uh, uh, but, and um, 
please stay in touch. That's the other thing I want to say. It's, it's wonderful to see, uh, as, it, uh, as it always is with our wonderful public lectures, it's wonderful to, to, to see these audiences turning up in Cambridge. Uh, but go to our website, um, join our mailing list, uh, stay in touch. Um, uh, I'm sure that in this audience, some of the people who are going to take this project forward over coming decades uh, are sitting here. Thank you very much.